Hey guys, welcome back to Analog Snippets. In last few videos, we have been discussing band gap circuits. Our discussion so far uses diodes to generate PTAT and CTAT voltages. But most of the practical circuits don't use diodes, they use BJTs. So let's begin with diode itself and see the issues that it causes. Let's start with recalling the reason we use diode to begin with. The exponential relationship between diode current and diode voltage enables us to generate a very precise PTAT voltage. Now the problem with diode is that this equation is not entirely correct. You may recall that this equation contains another factor n. n is also known as non-ideality factor of diode. We generally make many assumptions and simplification when we derive equations like these. For example, if we assume the diode current to be solely because of the minority carrier injection, we get the equation which does not contain n. But the actual phenomena is much more complicated. There are several other processes going on inside diode and one such process is recombination. This recombination happens in this space charge region. The recombination current is also exponentially dependent on its voltage. But it contains an additional divide by 2 factor within the exponential. Recombination current is a dominant current factor at the lower values of current. While at the higher values of current, current due to minority carrier injection dominates. The total current is the sum of these currents. Now there is no simple way to combine these two different types of exponential in a simple fashion. So conventionally we patch this equation using this n factor. Now this n varies with the current. So at lower value n is roughly 2 and as current increases it approaches 1. Also these two current follow different temperature dependency. So with temperature as well this n varies. So the end result is this factor n introduces lot of uncertainties in PTAT. And recall from the previous videos that this PTAT was supposed to be the most accurate of the PTAT and CTAT. Now in BJTs we can have much more desirable voltage current relationship. So now let's look at BJTs. BJTs are three terminal devices and it contain two PN junctions. So in forward active region one of the junction is forward bias and other junction is either reverse bias or zero bias. In normal operation minority carriers are injected across forward bias junction which in this case is base emitter junction. The reverse bias junction which is base collector junction just sweeps away the minority carriers from the base. So we have got three currents here corresponding to the three terminals. And emitter current is simply the sum of collector current and base current. Now recombination still happens in this forward bias junction. But this current flows mostly through the base terminal. Leaving collector current relatively free of these recombination currents. As a result collector current to base emitter voltage relationship is much closer to the desired ideal exponential relationship. So now we can use ratioed collector current to generate the PTAT voltages. Because of this additional terminal in BJTs. Many different band gap topologies are possible with VGTs which are not possible with diode. So let's quickly look at one such classic band gap architecture known as Broca band gap. This is classic Broca band gap circuit and it looks little different to what we have been seeing in the previous videos. So let's try to get our head around this circuit. So we have got sort of two branches over here. On the top we have got two resistors of the equal values. And this amplifier makes sure that these two resistors see the equal voltage across it. Which basically means that these two branches have the same current. Then we have got two BJTs. And Q2 is actually n time larger than Q1. So these are ratioed BJTs. And then we have got resistor R2. And if you look closely the voltage across this R2 is basically delta VBE. And since delta VBE is PTAT we have got PTAT current in these two branches. And since twice of PTAT current is also PTAT, so this R1 also has PTAT current. Now if we assume resistances to be relatively temperature independent, then we have got PTAT voltage across R1. And VBE1 being a diode voltage is CTAT voltage. And if we size this component appropriately, we have got band gap voltage at the output of the amplifier. So you can see that these BJTs are biased at collector terminal and the base current is supplied by this amplifier. So it's very neat and compact band gap architecture. But unfortunately in most of the CMOS processes we cannot use this architecture. And the reason for that is that most of the CMOS processes don't offer NPN in their standard device offering. An available PNP transfer can't be biased using collector terminal. Because as we'll see it has to be connected to ground. So let's now look at structure of BJTs commonly available in CMOS processes. So here we have a representation of a fairly common NVEL CMOS process. 
the silicon substrate is slightly p type and this p plus represent connection to this substrate and remember this substrate is connected to ground in the far left here we have an nmos device and then we have got n well on which we form the p mos device this n plus is the connection to n well and this is all the raw material available to us and we need to make bjt out of these so let's try to form an npn first so basically we are looking for a p material sandwiched between two n material so we basically see two possibilities one is over here the basic nmos structure and other is basically using this n plus p substrate and this n well so in the first structure one of the n plus x has collector the other x has emitter and substrate basically x has base and we need to make sure this channel is off so basically a zero voltage at the gate here now this looks very similar to an nmos operating in deep subthreshold region and indeed in deep subthreshold an nmos acts more or less like a bjt but we have got a problem here since our base terminal is basically substrate it has to be grounded and if base terminal of npn transistor is ground this transistor is basically off and the same thing will happen in the other structure so basically this type of process doesn't offer a usable npn transistor as we'll see we have better luck with pnp transistors again we have two possibilities so first option is using basically off pmos as pnp transistor so gate has to be supply this type of pnp is known as lateral pnp because we have got emitter base and collector in horizontal direction now some designs are reported using lateral pnp but it is not the most commonly used option there are basically two problem with this structure the first problem is this lateral pnp always have an associated parasitic pnp with it which is found by this p plus n well and then p substrate since the collector of this parasitic pnp being substrate is always grounded whenever this lateral pnp turns on this parasitic pnp also turns on so this parasitic pnp is always stealing the current hence increasing the power consumption of the circuit another most serious problem is the way current flows in this bjt structure so at low current current flows to the side walls mostly but at higher current this bottom side also comes into picture so basically the area of the current flow changes with the current and that means that the resistance also changes with the current and since it's a complex 3d layout dependent phenomena it's very difficult to model and that is the reason that most of the design don't use lateral pnp device so we are only left with this parasitic structure which is found by p plus n well and p substrate and this is known as vertical pnp device because here emitter base and collector are now vertically placed now this is not a particularly good pnp if you want to design amplifier or current mirrors and this is because base width being rather large results in very low beta or low current gain but it turns out to be just good enough for most of the pan gap applications so now let's see how we use this pnp in our actual designs so you've got this vertical pnp and this is basically the cross section and this is top view so in the layout this looks basically like rectangle within rectangle so we have got n well and then an active layer to connect this n well then we have got another active which is basically p plus and we have got another p plus over here which is basically substrate connection and this is basically symbol with the collector grounded of course because it is substrate so it is obvious that we cannot bias this pnp to its collector which is the most recommended way because we don't have any access to collector so instead we have to bias this pnp through emitter and we use this uh, bjt in so called diode connected configuration so we basically ground the base as well so now we can reuse the architecture we have been discussing so far in the previous videos and basically replace all the diode with this pnp structure but at this point one can ask that by biasing this transistor through emitter we are not doing the ideal thing basically now we are introducing back all the recombination current which is generated in base emitter junction so how is it better than using a diode so i can think of three reason why it's still better to use this bjt rather than a diode the first reason is the current gain beta and because of that base current is a smaller component of total emitter current so even for low beta the situation is better in bjts as compared to diodes the second reason is the availability of very accurate bjt spice models now because band gaps are traditionally built using bjts 
and this structure is the only practical usable BGT in CMOS processes. Foundries has been very diligent in modeling this BGT very accurately. Diode models are usually not very accurate and also there are so many options to choose from so this also adds to the confusion. Because from Foundry's perspective it's much better to accurately model one device rather than four or five different types of diodes. The third reason is although we are connecting base to ground here but we do have an option to connect it differently. There have been some design reported where base connection is used differently to improve the accuracy. Now let's briefly talk about an issue which plagues the design which use these kind of BJTs. Since the substrate is the collector of this vertical PNP transistor and substrate is basically shared with everything else in the chip, this BJT is highly susceptible to any noise injection in the substrate. So here are some recommendation and design practices that should be considered. The first recommendation is that if you've got any kind of switching circuit in your design, such as DC-DC or class D amplifier, then keep your band gap as far as possible from those circuits as you can. Same recommendation also applies to digital circuits, especially the one which is switching. Another highly recommended practice is to surround the circuit with robust guard rings. This is applicable to both the aggressor and the band gap circuits. The aggressor circuits are usually put inside a double guard rings. Also, it is a good idea to give a dedicated connection to BJT substrate. The best thing is to give BJT its own dedicated substrate pin. And if it is too much to ask, then a dedicated star connection must be considered. So for example, if this is the sub pad in the chip, then you can have a different wire going to the BJT and different wire going to the other circuits. In some processes, you also have an option of deep n -well. So aggressor circuits can be put inside deep n -well. Now, if a process has deep n -well, then there is a possibility of having a vertical NPN transistors as well. So deep anvil is basically a buried anvil layer. So here this anvil is below the surface of the substrate. And looking from the top, it looks like a rectangle. Then we have normal anvil surrounding the boundary of this deep anvil layer. So this structure basically creates an isolated P-well. So these deep anvil layers are usually used to give NMOS their own substrate, much like the PMOS. Now this isolated PVL doesn't need to be grounded, so we can now make our vertical NPN transistor. So this kind of structure gives good immunity to substrate noise. But not all technology have this kind of NPN, and even if they have it, it may not be very accurately modeled. So check with your foundry before using NPN transistor. Another note, so if you can see this anvil forms a diode between anvil layer and the P substrate layer. And this diode is usually reverse biased. But at high temperature, this diode can cause appreciable leakage. So one solution to this problem is to have dummy structures to basically cancel out the leakage on the both sides. And as a final note, isolated PVL not only makes the vertical NPN possible, but we can also make lateral NPN using the isolated PVL. But again, same as lateral PNP, the lateral NPN also has the parasitic vertical NPN with it. And also there is problem related to the current flow in that uh, lateral NPN transfer. I would like to end this video with giving some examples from my own experience. By far the most band gap that I have seen or designed use vertical PNP transistor. As for vertical NPN, I have seen two designs using vertical NPN, one in 55 nanometer technology and one in 14 nanometer technology. And I have seen just one design which actually uses diode. And the reason was that there was no BJT in that technology. So this is all in this video. So post your comments below and thanks for watching.